I'm going to start today with a quick Irma update. There's some in interesting information here about palm trees that I wasn't aware of. And some of the threats that the storm's going to bring to the states. Welcome to the weekend from Miami, Florida. Chris St. Clair, Mark Robinson. Um, I want to show you some video of the devastation uh, earlier in the week. Irma through Antigua, Barbuda, I mean, almost wiped clean. I mean, just unbelievable devastation. Yeah, and that's what you get when you have a Category 5 landfall when that right side of the eyewall comes over the island. You're talking about almost like standing inside an EF3, EF4 tornado for hours on end. It's no wonder the destruction is so complete. One of the last things things left standing though, palm trees. I mean, the fronds will get stripped off, but the tree, the, I mean, it's designed perfectly. Well, it's actually evolved that way. So these trees, are, you actually see them right there. They start going crazy in even the slightest breeze. When when those palm fronds come off, they'll just rip right off, and all you're left with is a stick, which has very little wind resistance. So the palm trees actually survive quite well because the palms just regrow. It's the imported trees, the oaks, the maples that have been brought down here. Those are the ones that have very shallow root base. They're not evolved to be in this area. Down they go. Okay, let me let's show you the uh, future radar because we're the, what, the rain that we're getting now. This is this is not the hurricane. This is part of it, but not well, this not it. Yeah, this is well. It gets kind of is it. This is the outer bands. Now these outer bands can actually produce thunderstorms because there's enough instability there and the wind this shear isn't tearing them to pieces. And now you only get that lightning when you get back into the eye wall because of the amount of energy within that eye wall. One of the other things we haven't talked enough about I think um, is that there will be tornadoes associated with this. Yes, that is a big danger. In fact, we're actually in a tornado danger area as, this, as the storm begins to move north. You will see on that right front quadrant that you're going to get tornadoes. Okay. Ross, uh, more on what Irma's been up to and what it's going to do from you. All right, guys, thank you so much for that. Yes, if all the other hazards weren't enough, we're expecting the risk of severe weather. So tornadoes are an absolute concern anytime you get a landfalling tropical system. And that's going to be a concern for much of Florida today as Irma makes its approach from south to north. The latest stats, 210 kilometer an hour sustained wind. Here's a look at the last nine hours on the satellite imagery and just absolutely awful what we're looking at because we've had the eye wall scraping this entire coastline of northern Cuba the entire time. So producing destructive wind, significant waves, and big time storm surge. And so we're expecting very bad damage on the north coast of Cuba with that. Then after that, it, Irma's going to take a northward turn into the lower to middle Florida Keys by early Sunday morning and piling up all this water from the Atlantic into the Keys, into Biscayne Bay, into Miami. So a strong onshore wind component is going to bring a big time storm surge risk in the southern and central Florida here. As we head towards the next couple of days, Mar Irma ahead and your long rangers coming up next as well. Well, we continue to track Hurricane Irma here at the Weather Network. And Erin, Irma now has been a major hurricane in the Atlantic Basin for over eight days now. Yeah, so that's over a Category 3 or higher. Mm -hmm. And it already reached Category 5 strength multiple times. So it impacted the Lesser Antilles, areas like Cuba. So finally pulling away from the Cuba coast, but being a major impact into Florida State right now. Yeah, the wind field on Irma is just massive. And as we take a look at the satellite imagery, as well as water vapor, it's actually showing some of this moisture getting drawn up into uh, semi my stationary boundary which is draped across Newfoundland here in Canada and so we're also seeing kind of some rainfall enhancement across the Avalon right now and that's due to Irma. Yeah so that's just tropical moisture being streamed up from the system and you know it's 
not just a U.S. impact, it was a Canadian impact. Um, however, it did make landfall this morning in the Florida Keys as a Category 4 strength hurricane. Mm-hmm. But let's see where it's going next. So as you take a look at the track, uh, we are expecting Irma to kind of interact with a little bit more wind shear in the environment. That can always uh, kind of weaken it a little bit, tear it apart, uh, kind of become a little bit more disorganized. So as we take a look at the latest National Hurricane Center forecast track, it does have it kind of running parallel along the Gulf Coast of Florida potentially making landfall as a Category 3 hurricane, although uh, close towards like Marco Island and into like Gulvin Bay, uh, potential landfall in there as a 3 or a 4. I'm going to interrupt here for a quick second. If you notice the new predicted track, it is now turning towards us. (laughs) It's exactly like I predicted. This is what I was saying. When, When they get close to us, these storms either to the south or to the west, they tend to get drawn towards us. And, well, as you can see, the computer model is now saying that. I don't need computers to tell me that. That's their normal behavior. When they get close to us, they get pulled into us. So, at this point, things are looking up for me. I'm not too good for the southern areas down there, getting all the damage and that, but this is what I was waiting for. The remnants of these perfect conditions for what I enjoy and by the time they get to us it's their dangers past it's usually we don't normally even get any wind from them it's just really heavy warm rain like I was saying and that, at this point is how it's looking kind of favorable for me but unfortunately in order for me to enjoy this other people have to suffer first so, I'm going to play the rest of this. It's not related, but in case anyone else is interested. Yeah, so that's the thing we're going to be watching for next. Currently just west of the Everglades right now, but into the late afternoon on mm-hmm. Sunday, into the evening hours, potentially making that landfall that Kelly was just mentioning. So areas like Naples and Fort Myers, Sarasota, we're watching out for for this uh, Category 3 or 4 hurricane to you know impact them throughout the afternoon. Now, this is the hard part because... Mm-hmm. The, the terrain is such an important part when you're talking about hurricanes. And so let's just talk about the actual elevation here. So a lot of these areas are near sea level. Mm-hmm. Marco Island, for example, is right at sea level. So as we start to see this storm surge come in, which actually you've been paying attention to social media, we've been seeing uh, visuals out of some of these areas that actually the water is retreating away from the shorelines. Mm-hmm. So that's usually what you see when you have the offshore winds. It's when these onshore winds start to build back in mm-hmm. as the hurricane eye approaches it brings all that upwelled water and the winds just smash it into the coast now what I want to highlight here is you can see all this green area so this is the Everglades so we're not too concerned about this uh, but it's when you start to head in towards Marco Island uh, Naples as well so that's what an elevation of Naples is about three feet so uh, not high at all. No, exactly. And we're expecting storm surge well above that. So once the the system or the eye continues to track a little bit further north and we get more of that onshore flow. Mm-hmm. Um, and then even areas like Fort Myers, a little bit higher, about 10 feet uh, mm-hmm. above sea level. But we're talking about storm surge with waves, yeah. heights of 10 to 15 feet along the west coast of Florida. Areas into Miami has already started to see uh, significant flooding into the downtown core as well. Yeah. With very strong winds pummeling out of the southeast. Yeah, I was going to say uh, areas like Miami. Miami Airport has already reported a gust of 151 kilometers an hour and we've already started to see some photos as well of kind of window panes the glass of already starting to crack because of these strong wind gusts yeah so more up, uh, more updates on Irma mm-hmm. in the next few hours I'm gonna talk a little bit about driving on the road I mentioned in the past there are some places I won't drive on the road and some places I won't drive on the sidewalk. Well, there's a lot of reasons for that. Many of the sidewalks in town here are in really, really horrible condition and even just by design they're, they're not scooter friendly. But having said that, the monster is so fast. I kind of got used to driving it on the road. I feel it's too fast for the sidewalk. And, Especially, you know, when you get into the bumpy areas, the front of it is not much shock absorption there whatsoever. But now that I've gone back to the ES950, it's a lot slower, and it just, it doesn't feel right on the road anymore. So, my habits have changed a little bit, 
videos that I've been showing, you may have noticed I've been on the sidewalk a lot more than I normally have, but there are still some places I can't do that. And this road is one of them. And the sidewalk on the right, the lowered areas for the laneways, the edges of them are so steep. I even taking the ES950 over them, I gotta be careful, otherwise I'll wheelie on them. And <laughs> if I took the monster down this sidewalk at high speed, I'd probably launch over them. So, that's the one on the right. The one on the left, the sidewalk itself isn't too bad. It's the transitions between the sidewalk and the road. And then I come up to an intersection here, come down, it's, it's not too bad. But when I go up on the other side, the sidewalk is lower than the curb. So basically when I come off the road, I go up over the curb and I'm back down onto the sidewalk and, you know, actually hear the wheelie bars hit the curb. And I've actually got stuck on this a couple times. The wheelie bars grab it and I gotta get off and lift the scooter over it. It's just, just crazy. And there's a lot of areas like this. But the town's been replacing these transitions a little bit at a time, mainly on the the main road, but you know, they've been doing a good job with that. But as that's one of the main reasons why I drive the scooter on the road. It's just it's the sidewalks are for the most part getting on and off them is an issue. Today's project is installing the carpet in the shelter. And if you notice something's missing, it's the ES950. Ah, there it is. Charlie's carjacked it again. Anytime he sees me outside work and he comes over and hops on the scooter. <laughs> That's alright. But the nice thing with the interruption here is I'm looking at this project that I gotta do and I got so much that I have to take out of the shelter to prepare for it. And that's one of the, the biggest problems with the projects that I do. The preparation and the cleanup afterward. It's a lot of times that's worse than the, the project itself. But in order to do it, it's something that has to be done. So the whole idea here of putting the rocks out front and putting the carpet in the shelter itself is to prevent the muddy mess in the springtime as well as keeping the dog from digging craters. As when I put the first first section of rocks out, the dog couldn't dig there anymore, and I'd go out for a rail trail tour or something, and I'd come home and, well, he went beyond them and <laughs> dug a big crater in the middle of the shelter. And I was getting really upset. That's why I originally put the plywood pieces in there, just to keep them from digging. But in the springtime, this whole area was just absolutely horribly muddy. It, just, it was just nuts. And the soil is really rich in clay, so it's really slick. And trying to back the monster out of the shelter, and the tires would spin. And it was kind of creating ruts in the ground where I was parking. So I'm trying to prevent that from happening again. Uh, the rocks will help on the outside. And the carpet, it won't stop the ground from getting soft. They'll probably still end up getting indentations from parking the monster in and out or driving the monster in and out or the ES950 in and out depending on whether I get the monster going again or not. But it won't be muddy. And that's the whole the whole plan. But I'm not 100% sure how I'm going to do this. I have an idea. And I'm going to try. If it doesn't work, well, no big deal. I'll just try something else. So, that's what I have planned for today. And, wait to start working here. And Charlie's going to take off and do a tour. I don't have a camera on the scooter today, so he starts ramming parked vehicles or flipping the bird to a bus full of first graders. Or Gets himself in a low-speed police chase. <laughs> I'm not going to know about it. But it's pretty highly unlikely that any of that is going to happen. So and I, just wonderful job. Start pulling stuff out and getting ready.
thing I'd like to point out about the monster is it will move. And, um, if I try to get any kind of power out of it or any kind of speed, then that's when whatever is happening becomes an issue by just moving it around in this particular area at low speed and no power is not an issue for it so at least I have that option I don't have to actually push it it's not fun trying to push this thing So what I'm planning to do here is have the carpet on the outside and I'm going to staple the edge to the 2x6 at the entrance and then I'm going to fold the carpet over and then put the 10 inch spikes back in the ground to hold it all down and this way I don't have the edge of the carpet at, at the, the entrance that things can catch on and rip it or just cause it to curl upwards or whatever and if that turns out it won't be enough, then I'll put a second roll of staples on the outside of it just to keep the fold downwards. 
and lessen the possibility that anything will catch on it. So that's what my plan is. Um, not entirely sure if it'll work the way I plan to, but that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to try it anyway, see what happens. Now it's going to end the video here. Uh, the folder that I have these video files in is labeled as begin and there's another folder for tomorrow labeled as end. So at this point it looks like the job's complete so I was kind of curious to see what else there was to do and it turns out I went and got more more of the 10 inch spikes so I'm going to include that here to finish off this entire project and it's all done. I won't have to come back to it again. So thanks for watching. And I'm not exactly sure if I have any more projects that I want to do before winter hits. I know one for sure, but I guess I'll talk about that one later.